Thank you for listening to the Mutual Audio Network. We're here for you 24-7. But fair warning, some of the shows are a little cranky if you get them up too early. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. Piercing. So much pain. <clears throat> Where am I? Why am I outside? I was just tied up in a chair. W was I rescued? Did it even really happen? My hands are covered in blood. So much blood. Hello, Dusty. Dusty! Huh? Uh, oh, sorry. I was daydreaming again. Are you all right? You're losing focus a lot lately. I mean, it's not my business, but it's not like you to do that. Everything okay at home? Yeah, I guess I haven't gotten much sleep lately. Well, I know we aren't that close, but you can talk to me if you need to. I nodded as he left the office. I didn't want to lie to Sam, but I still didn't know what's going on. My memories since the last night were warped. I was missing time. I know they beat the heck out of me, but did I get brain damaged? I'm grasping at straws here. And even if there's nothing wrong with my brain, why did I wake up covered in blood? Whose blood was it? What if I hurt someone? And what if those guys came looking for me? They know who I am. Frank, I could really use you right now. Frank, I think we're clear for now. There's only one way out other than the front door, and I've barricaded it. Are we just going to wait it out till morning and hope they're nocturnal? That's a strong possibility. Reach into that bag. I picked up the satchel and stuck my hand inside. I've been carrying this thing around, and I hadn't once considered what's inside of it. Obviously, I was a little preoccupied. I grasped what felt like a handle and pulled it out of the bag. It was a very large knife, or a small sword, depending on your definition. The handle was wrapped in black leather, the hilt and pommel gleaming a brilliant silver. There were runic etchings scrawled symmetrically in the center of the blade. What's this, Ulysses? You hold on out on me with magical weaponry? Despite your sarcasm, yes, it is imbued with enchantments. Apparently, there's a whole hell of a lot I don't know about in this world. And what began as a smirk after my smart-ass remark was now a crow-eating frown. Is this some legendary blade that's slain a thousand demons? With a name like Harbinger or Excalibur? It's a short sword with some hastily scribbled etchings by a novice, actually. If it had a name, it would be Scrap. You sure know how to let the air out of my balloon. Frank, do you hear that? Maybe it's a choir of angels singing the hymn of the legendary sword, Scrap. I'm serious, Frank. Why is it so quiet? I hadn't noticed, but our friends from the woods stopped trying to claw their way in. It was dead silent. 
A minute or two passed, with both Ulysses and I keeping an ear out for any slight sound. Nothing. It couldn't have been daybreak already. I wondered if the creatures are simple-minded and gave up when they got bored, like a cat or a dog. I think it's in our best interest to camp inside for the night. There's an old hearth over there. Shall we start a fire? It is getting a little chilly. I gathered some dry wooden scraps laying about. Old wooden pews and shambles and splinters made for good burning. I heaved piles of it into the fireplace as Ulysses organized the kindling and set it ablaze. I instantly got shivers from the radiating heat. You okay, Frank? This isn't what we expected, is it? This isn't the first time behind enemy lines. I was an infantryman in the war. In the 166th, they called me Jack. But your real name is Frank, yes? How did you get the moniker Jack? Well, it's not exactly a cute story. Frank, I've been around for a long time. The affairs of men throughout the years have always been quite gritty, to say the least. Please, continue. Alright. Well, after my dad skipped out on us, and I was old enough to serve, I joined the National Guard. But when the war started, sucking the rest of the world into it, we had to take up arms and become part of the 166th Infantry. They called us the Rainbow Division, because we had National Guardsmen from every state stretching across the country like a rainbow. There wasn't any pot of gold at the end of that one, though. We didn't think we'd see action so quickly, and before we knew it, we were in the trenches, fighting for our lives. We had a particularly rough week, where a crackshot sniper was holding us back for days, picking people off left and right. If anything was above ground level, it was as good as dead. One night, the sniper took out a close friend, blew Davis's face right off. Something in me snapped. I knew that I'd either go crazy in this hole, or I would have to get revenge for Davis. His family would have to say goodbye to a closed casket, if we even made it back home ourselves. I wiped Davis's blood off of my face, and I grabbed his pistol. I holstered it on the opposite side of my hip as my own. He refused to use his standard issue pistol, and brought his own revolver from home. His father had carved beautiful designs into the handle. One panel had a rosary, floating weightless, a symbol of faith and the other side sported a shield with his family coat of arms. I couldn't just let it rot in the mud and the blood in a foreign country, so I brought it with me. I brought him with me. I waited until the darkest point in the night. I looked for any type of distraction I could use to my advantage. We started running low on combat supplies a couple weeks ago, and I stopped into a town in France and bought up whatever the locals could give us. Some crappy rifles, dry clothes, and a type of grenade they called a hairbrush. And it was essentially a wooden stick with wire and block wrapped around an explosive charge and fuse. In order to initiate the fuse, you had to take a nail out of the hole in the side of the block and insert it into the front of the block in a different hole. Then you had to whack it against something to light it. Primitive, but effective. I found some of those grenades and grabbed one. I beat the nail head in with the sagging wall of the trench and hurled it as far as I could to the right side of the field. I started running to climb the trench along the left side of the battleground. I sprinted towards the enemy trenches as the skeleton crew focused their attention towards the grenade. It was the first explosive they've seen in days. It probably woke everyone in the allied trench as well. The enemy started volleying towards our trench unaware of my close proximity to their flank. My brothers in arms launched a flurry back at them. The chaos created a perfect scenario for my subterfuge. As I neared the trench with my bayonet drawn, a soldier noticed me. Before I could react, he brandished his firearm and squeezed the trigger. But nothing happened. His gun had jammed. Pale and frantic, he kept squeezing the trigger as I plunged down on him, bayonet piercing the cavity of his chest. Two more soldiers saw what happened. They went to fire as I steered the body at the end of my bayonet into the gunfire. I charged forward using my new shield, but when it was time to strike, I couldn't loose my rifle. The man I ran through held my barrel with a white knuckle death grip. 
He smiled through clenched teeth, oozing blood. I fired my rifle, but he didn't let go. The two men came at me with their own bayonets. One spike crunched into the stock of my gun, and the other dug into his comrade's shoulder. My adversary could no longer cling to my rifle, and his smile changed to painful wincing. I brought my barrel up, the action dragging the man to my right off balance, until he let go of his bayonet sticking into my stock. I fired two shots, but missed both from the weight displacement. I was struck in the face with the butt of the rifle wielded by the man on the left. I pulled out my trench knife and lunged at the soldier once more. He threw a hand up, which I pierced through, and with explosive force I drove into his heart as well. Cold, muddy steel pulled against my throat. The soldier I sent off kilter was now choking me from behind with his rifle. Ripping the knife back out of my enemy's heart, I stabbed the thigh of my assailant. When his pressure released, and he gripped his wound, I slit his throat and left him to his last breaths. Another soldier lay ahead of me, focused and firing in the allied direction. My knife again found its home plunged into crimson tissue. A broken wooden door cockeyed off of its hinges opened to a bunker, with a slotted window just large enough for rifle barrels. There were three men, all of them focused on the battlefield that lay ahead, and one of them had to be my sniper. I pulled down my pistol with my right hand, and Davis's pistol with my left. I lifted my arms and fired till my guns were empty. More soldiers piled in through the entrance to the bunker, and my vision went black. My unit took those trenches after I made a hole. The only thing I remembered after the bunker was Brady with his hand on my shoulder, saying I killed every man in the bunker with just my trench knife. My hand was coated with gobs of blood, some dry, some wet and dripping. Brady took the knife out of my reluctant hand and calmed me down. On the way back to France, the boys called me Jack the Ripper. They said they heard screams from the enemies outside the bunker, terrified, begging for mercy. Those boys always embellished a little when they told a story. At least I hoped this was a tall tale. Wow, oh, so heroism is a trend with you, isn't it? That pistol you carry with you, Frank, is it Davis's? I stopped by Davis's parents' house when I got back. I offered my condolences. I tried to hand over the pistol, but his dad wouldn't take it. He said it was mine now, and Davis would want me to have it. I stroked my thumb over the carvings of the rosary. Frank, why don't you get some sleep? I'll take the first watch. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Plopping down on the musty wood floor by the fire, I allowed my muscles to relax. My eyes waited, unable to resist closing. Not that I was fighting it. I drifted off into darkness. I shot awake. But I wasn't in a rundown ghost town. I was there again, in the trenches. Davis's fragmented face lay in front of me, half submerged in the muck. I looked away, but I was now in the bunker. I looked down at my hands. They were covered in blood, but it wasn't just that. They were more like claws, long, sharp, bone-like fingernails dripping and oozing. And then the blood turned to maggots writhing and overflowing through my beastly paws. I threw my arms around wildly to shake them off. I ran for the door outside the bunker, but there was a wall of bodies blocking it. I tried to move them, but they wouldn't budge. I ran to another door on the opposite side. I opened it, and as I stepped into the frame, I was in the orphanage. The basement door ajar. I went to draw my pistol, but it wasn't there. On the floor in front of the door was the syringe-adorned gauntlet that Jonah used as his murder weapon and means to extract blood from his victims. I picked it up and put it on. I walked down the steps, just like I did that night. Creeping down the hall lit by a lone flickering candle, I heard Jonah humming and raced into the room at the end of the hall. When I opened up the door, there was no Jonah. The kid I couldn't save was lying in a chair, lifeless. I went to grab him. But when I did, it wasn't the boy in the chair anymore. It was Lady. Why, Frank? Why did you let me die? It hurt so much, Frank. And you never came to save me. It hurt so much, Frank. You never came to save me. Stop. 
Stop! After I yelled, the room was empty. Of furniture, shelves, just the old walls of the orphanage and its peeling paint and rotting boards. I looked down and both Lady and the boy were on the floor with holes in their necks. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Hey Frank, thanks for cleaning up my mess. We really make a good team, don't we? <laughs> You're just like me! You're just like me! Why don't we save them all, Frank? Frank, <gasps> Frank wake up. We have a problem. The look on Ulysses' face was an expression of horror, as the sounds of skittering and wood splitting clamored from above us. I didn't have time to process my own stomach churning from the nightmare that felt all too real, but not as real as the nightmare unfolding above us. I could actually see the boards bowing and crackling. Frank, take the knife. Okay, but what are you going to use? I already have a gun. Well, your gun might not work. Besides, I brought something for myself. What, is that a crossbow? Yes, and unlike Scrap over there, this beauty is master crafted. You might have to write your love letter to your toy later. The ceiling gave way from the floor above, and in spilled dark figures, looking much smaller than they did outside the shadows cast by fog and forest. A shape lunged out at me but I was frozen with shock at the features of the creature. It had uneven proportions, making up its face, sunken yet bulging eyes, large ears, and a malnourished body like a cheap cloth wrapped over bone. When it was but an inch away from my face, Ulysses loosed a bolt from his crossbow, pinning it to the wall. A moment later, and it caught a blaze. Writhing in pain, it burned to ash before I took another breath. Now you definitely owe me one, Frank. Smirking, I gave him a nod. Fair is fair, after all. Half of the little monsters charged ahead towards me, while the other half cowered at the sight of Ulysses and his weapon. What the hell are these things? Well, these would typically be kobolds, but something isn't right about them. Like, they've been corrupted by something. They usually have distended stomachs from overeating the local flora and fauna, but it looks like... They haven't been eating in centuries. They also would never attack something bigger than them, even in a large group like this. Well, I don't think they're afraid of us. We must have killed 50 of them. They were weak, unarmed, and dull. None of them had any spark of life left in their eyes. The room was filled with gore, reminiscent of my nightmare in the bunker. I shelved the thought away. I needed to compartmentalize to avoid a breakdown. So that's all of them, then? It seems that way. The bodies of the slain kobold started twitching. Subtle at first, then wildly. The ones that still had their heads attached anyways. But they weren't attacking. They were stumbling and crawling away. I looked at Ulysses, and he just stared, dumbfounded. When our eyes met, he just shrugged. So we followed the not-so-dead creatures. They mindlessly bumped into the front door, over and over. Ulysses, what if we set them free and see where they go? Agreed. Maybe there's even more mysteries in this ghost town than we anticipated. <clears throat> where the hell are they going? It looks like they're headed towards a small chapel at the other end of town. If I thought the town itself was dark and imposing, it seemed a shining paradise compared to the chapel. It was untouched by the rot that glazed over the rest of the town, which somehow made it worse. Like it was so vile, everything had stayed as far away as it could. That is, except for these kobolds. Ulysses, I really don't like the look of that place. I hope this isn't what it looks like. Which is? The undead retreating to an unholy chapel? This reeks of necromancy. Which is? Magic. Allowing the manipulation of the dead. Jesus Christ. Far from it, I'm afraid. You know, just weeks ago, none of the shit existed to me. I missed that. What I really missed was Lady. And being the man I thought was too strong to give in to rage and revenge. The kobolds couldn't open the chapel door. So I assisted them in their quest yet again. The door opened to vacant pews and a dusty altar. Light shone through a stained glass window, 
in dapples of red, yellow, and blue. The creatures crawled down the center of the room until they hit the altar. A skeletal hand dangled off of the pulpit. So what happens if the necromancer is dead too? Oh my, that's interesting. But if he's dead, why are all the kobolds still animated? Ulysses? I see it, Frank. Ulysses drew his crossbow, bracing for a possible battle. The rattling corpse of the necromancer lifted up its decrepit arms, weaving something into the air. After a brief pause, the remains dropped back onto the pulpit and shattered into the altar below. Well then, that was... What's happening to the kobolds? They're melting together. A writhing pile of kobold pieces combined into a large beast, with limbs protruding, ears and eyes grotesquely contorted into knots. The mouths grimaced and produced a horrific howl. Covering my ears, I ran for the exit, only to have debris hurled in my path. Frank, we may have to fight this thing. How many arrows do you have left? Four, and they're bolts. Not the time, Ulysses. We narrowly avoided a crashing fist. I pulled out my pistol and shot at the beast. My shots landed, but the only thing I succeeded at was pissing it off. Now the focus was on chasing after me. I fired more impotent rounds, evading swipes by the creature. I ran to the columns by the stained glass window. The dust kicked up by the monster's assault provided some cover. Darting behind a pillar, I holstered my pistol. It was dead quiet. I felt myself being hunted. Wasn't sure where Ulysses was, or if he had even survived. I remembered my new sword, Scrap, was pretty effective during the skirmish in the house. I unsheathed the blade, and in doing so, I hit the lighter out of my pocket. When I bent down to quickly grab it, the pillar was shattered from the center. If I hadn't moved, I would have had my block taken right off. Parts of the ceiling came loose and crashed onto the floor, shaking it. I fell flat on my ass from the force. Before I could get up, the franken kobold hurled its hand at me. I closed my eyes and slashed. The creature held in pain, clutching its hand, which I severed two fingers from. Frank, get out of there! The floor is giving way! Oh shit. Shit, 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 shit! I was losing my footing as Ulysses covered my escape with a few volleys from his crossbow. Unfortunately, I didn't start running soon enough, and I couldn't keep pace with the fracturing wood. I fell through and launched my hand forward. As soon as I thought myself swallowed by the fissure, Ulysses grabbed my hand. Hang on, Frank! Do I have a choice? Ulysses pulled me up to ground level, and just as I thought I was safe, the undead monstrosity lunged at us, collapsing the remainder of the floor. We sank to the abyss below, the hole above getting smaller and smaller until the light above was just a pinprick. Well, stranger, we appreciate you stopping by to spend some time with us in the shadows. If you want more Neon Shadows, head over to at Neon Shadows Pod on all social media and check out our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Neon Shadows Pod. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. The cast of this episode was Dusty Willis, voiced by Dan Faulkner. Sam, voiced by Ellie Hirschman. Frank Dixon, voiced by Ian Knowles. And Ulysses, voiced by Sean Goodrich. The theme song is Neon Shadows, performed by Amber Wren, written by Tyler Brown and Ian Knowles. Neon Shadows was created and written by Ian Knowles. All rights reserved, copyright Blunderbuss Studios 2021. Reuse or reproduction of our content is strictly prohibited.
This is Thursday Thrillers, audio with action on the Mutual Audio Network. Join us tomorrow on Mutual with Friday Follies, the end of the week collection of comedy cut-ups. You can subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed for every day of audio drama that fits your fancy. Or find the Friday Follies feed in your favorite podcast players. Now that's a lot of effus. The Mutual Audio Drama Network, where we listen and imagine together.